informal means here he is, you know. <laughs> he is. That's good. I know nothing informal about it. Uh, Bob? So Bob or William? His first name is William. That's right. Well, the first thing he's going to tell us, I think, is why we call him Bob and <laughs> William. Right? But seriously, um, he needs no introduction, I think, to you, because he's been with us for a while now. He's participated in most things that I've been aware of. And in fact, I'm delighted that he uh, chose to join the International Committee. And uh, Bob or William, uh, you played your part, I know, back in September. And I thank you for that. Yeah. Look forward to your future uh, cooperation and good assistance. I know you've got a lovely wife, Pam. I've met in other circumstances, but I'm not going to spoil your thunder, I'm going to let you tell us yeah, about okay. your life and time. Yes, yeah. oh. Well, my story begins in Early Cottage Hospital. <laughs> oh, it is, uh, In South London, where I was born on the 12th of May 1940 which was two days after Winston Churchill was made Prime Minister. So when I tell you my initials are WRW, you can guess what the third one stands for, because you know the first two. Winston? Winston. Yeah. Um, and my father was a life, lifetime Tory supporter. Oh, yeah. Um, <laughs> <laughs> which, uh, sorry, that's what I'm to say. There's another reason for it. Um, we lived in a flat there. above a shop in a place called Selsden, which is a suburb of Croydon, to the south of Croydon. And I lived there um, with my parents for the first 19 years of my life. Um, and then I went to university. Um, I went to a local primary school. Before that, oh yes. <laughs> um, during the war, we were evacuated for a short time to Farncombe in Surrey. Uh, to be close to my father's parents, but very soon my mother decided she preferred the bombing to <laughs> her in-laws, so we very quickly returned <laughs> to Croydon. Uh, we were in a prime spot for the Luftwaffe. Um, we were surrounded by uh, two fighter stations, well three actually, uh, Biggin Hill, Kenley and Croydon. <laughs> And we had the London Brighton railway line within about a mile and a half of us. The Catrum Guards Depot, where all the, the guards did their training, about five miles away. And so, you know, it was a pretty hot spot. However, when we returned from our evacuation and entered the flat for the first time, um, there'd been a direct hit on two houses just behind the flat, and they'd been demolished. But our kitchen windows had been blown in, and I remember seeing the slivers of glass embedded in the plaster, and thinking, had we been there when that had happened, we'd have been absolutely lacerated. Um, the other memory I have of the war is um, in September 44, I started primary school, and we had um, air raid shelter practice. Not under fire, I hasten to add, but you know, just to make sure that we knew what to do in the event of an attack. Unfortunately, that never came. So those are really the only two memories I had of the war. So I think I was very fortunate, really. <laughs> um, lots of people here, I'm sure, have much less happy memories of the, of the war. So I went to the local primary school, and then I was fortunate enough to um, go to a grammar school at age 11. Uh, the most convenient grammar schools for me would have been in Croydon, which was only a mile and a half away. But um, because Croydon is a county borough, and we live just outside the boundary, I had to go <coughs> a lot further, go through Croydon to the other side, to Wallington, uh, to go to my grammar school, because only residents of Croydon were permitted to attend their, their schools. Um, I, I stayed at grammar school until I was 19, and I, um, I got an open scholarship to uh, Southampton University to read chemistry. But, unfortunately, <laughs> um, my successes then came to a bit of an end because um, in 1962 I only achieved a past degree. Uh, however, during my time at university, uh, I met my wife, my family lived in Southampton, and I was very fortunate to spend the whole of my time in a hall of residence. Because I was a, a scholar, I had that option, and um, socially that, that, that was brilliant. Um, but academically, 
and it's down the side, you were tempted into other avenues. <laughs> While I was at school, we had um, an inspirational French master who conducted all the lessons in French. And, you know, when, when you're that age, you think, well, all French lessons are like that. But I've since discovered that that was very unusual at that time, in 19, early 1950s. Um, and he also arranged an exchange with Dunkirk. I think he could have chosen somewhere a bit more attractive. But, uh, <laughs> um, the point was you got the experience, the experience of living with a French family for a couple of weeks, which I found riveting. I was, you know, I'm a life, lifelong francophile as a result of that experience. You know, everything in France then was different. <coughs> Exchangee wore different trousers to me. He wore culottes. You know, like dust colours. <laughs> he didn't wear a school uniform, but he wore a beret. Um, the streets were paved with pavé <laughs> instead of, you know, smooth asphalt. Uh, the food in those days was quite different. They did things like making their own mayonnaise and, you know, very, <laughs> very French. And of course, being France, there was alcohol to be tasted. I was 14 years, years old at the time. But they have no inhibitions about giving youngsters alcohol, so you know I was able to have my first taste of alcohol. And I can remember going out one day with Francois <coughs> on our bikes, and uh, we went into a bar, and I had this drink called Porter Trente Neuf, which is a, a rather strong porter type drink. And cycling home, I don't know how I didn't fall into the canal, <laughs> but there we are. I survived. I lived to tell the tale. So at 19, as I say, I went to university, met my wife Pam, um, and then on graduation I got my first job in Stratford at a company called F.W. Burke Limited, which was located right next door to West Ham Underground Station. At the time there were a multitude of little chemical companies in East London, in that area, Bush Boak, Allen, and uh, all the white noodles. Anyway, I opted to go there. But I knew almost in my first day that I was going to, wasn't going to stay there. It was a grim place. It was like a kind of Victorian chemical factory. They made sulfuric acid. And, oh, it was just a horrible place. <laughs> anyway, um, I went into Diggs because, you know, commuting from Croydon and all on in Wanstead. And um, my landlady drew my attention to an advertisement for a part-time teacher of mathematics at West Ham College of Technology. And this is how I started to teach. Uh, one evening a week, enjoyed it. While I was there, I noticed that they were advertising uh, a new course, a master's degree course in analytical chemistry, um, which was due to start that autumn. And uh, by this time, yeah, soon after that we got married and we discussed it between us and my wife agreed to support me to do this one year full-time master's degree. And during the time I was studying for the degree, I did some part-time teaching at the college. And then, <clears throat> fortunately for me, at the end of that time, a post of assistant lecturer became vacant. I applied for it and got it. Um, after we got married, we lived in a flat in Wanstead, actually facing Wanstead Park, which was a, a very pleasant location. Uh, I say a, a flat, that's a polite description. It was rooms in a house. There were three lots of tenants, two spinster ladies and ourselves. And um, after six months there, the, uh, the owners of the house very considerately decided to sell the place. <laughs> so we had to move on. But the um, the plus point of it was we were able to buy all the furniture in the house. So, you know, having moved into a furnished flat with, with nothing, <laughs> we were able to buy a bedroom suite, dining room suite, three-piece suite, an almost new gas cooker for 80 quid. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Amazing. Quid. And it was, it was good stuff because the owner of the house had lived in that flat before he died, <coughs> and his son had then left the house as three flats, at least that's Sets of rooms. And in fact, um, an antique dealer who came to have a look around, he said, oh, those um, repro mahogany chairs, carved back chairs, he says, you've got your 80 pounds worth in those. 
three, uh, two carvers and <coughs> four dummy chairs. So we were very, very fortunate. And um, <coughs> we then moved to a flat, again, <laughs> near a park, backing onto Valentine's Park up to Gans Hill. Um, during that time there, Pam became pregnant, so we thought, hmm, it's not really very good, you know, <laughs> rented rooms with a young child. So uh, we thought we'd go into Romford and we went to Andrews and Partners. <coughs> And in those days, the agents would take you around in their cars. And we didn't have a car then, obviously. And um, the first place we visited was Upminster. <laughs> and I'd never heard of the place before, <laughs> before we came there. <laughs> and um, we bought our first house in Terraced House in Avon Road. That was 1966. <coughs> and we paid the princely sum of £4,700. <laughs> now, I, we had £500 deposit, but the building society wouldn't lend us the extra £200, would you believe? <laughs> you tell people the story, youngsters today, they, they don't believe. You know. Anyway, we borrowed the £200 from my mother, so I then paid her, her back over some period of time. We also had our conveyancing fees on HP as well, because <laughs> we used a solicitor that my father had used over many years. Jerry, is paid up? His, 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 partner kept, his partner kept writing to us and saying, oh, come on, you know, we want some more. So, anyway, we paid up. <laughs> and then, um, at work, yes. Uh, we're now 1966. Um, our daughter arrived in November 66. Um, she was born in the house in Avon Road. And then our son was born um, 15 months later, again, in, in the house in Avon Road. Um, and then we decided that it would be nice to have something with two separate rooms instead of a, you know, a three room. So we moved to a house in Leesway and that's where we are now. Um, as far as work, work was concerned, um, I wasn't exactly the best qualified person in the chemistry department because most of my colleagues had PhDs. So I always felt a little bit vulnerable. Anyway, in 1971, I think it was, that lovely lady Margaret Thatcher arrived at the college and opened the North East London Polytechnic. So instead of West Ham Col uh, College of Technology, we became the North East London Polytechnic. And uh, 30 polytechnics were created over the country. And um, in a number of cases, two colleges were fused to form a polytechnic. But uniquely, in our case, three local colleges were joined together to form one polytechnic. So, three chemistry departments <laughs> formed, joined together to form one. And I thought, this seems a bit dodgy to me, you know. <laughs> You've got all these extra people that aren't really needed. Uh, I can see there being a problem here, particularly since I'm not that well qualified. So, um, the Polytechnic authorities offered people the opportunity to retrain. They said if people wanted to move into other areas, they would give them a year off to take a higher degree at their expense and at full salary. So I decided to do that, went to London College of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine for a year, and um, <clears throat> got this MSc, and then came back and joined the biology department, and that's where I ended up. And I ended up, strange enough, teaching human physiology. <laughs> um, the um, next thing that happened in the Polytechnic, um, at the old West Ham College of Technology, the degree courses had all been London University <coughs> internal degrees. It was all science and engineering. That meant that we had what were called rich and recognised teachers at the college who sat on the exam boards. So, you know, you knew something about what, is, what was like to be set of the topics that were going to come up in, in the examination. But we had, no one, apart from that, we had no control over it. The syllabus was dictated by the University of London. When the Polytechnics were set up, this body called the Council for National Academic Awards was set up which was to moderate <coughs> degrees uh, being run by these new polytechnics and certain other colleges. So it was quite an interesting time in a way, having been told what to teach, you know, 
we were then enabled to construct our own courses with control from this body to make sure that the standards were okay. Um, but of course, people don't like change, and you know it was quite stressful in some ways. Anyway, the new courses were accepted and, and grew and so on, and there were some very good ones. Um, the one I was associated with, with which had a, a very good reputation, um, was the um, sandwich degree in applied biology. Students would come into the university, sorry, the Polytechnic at that time, for two years. They then go into an industrial placement for a year in a drug company or something like that. And then they come back and do their final year at the university. And employers would snap those people up because they had that year of industrial experience under their belt. You know. <laughs> employers are always looking for you know, young people that don't want a lot of money. <laughs> but they want them with experience. <laughs> and an almost impossible situation. But these kids had, got it, had a year's experience working in the laboratory, doing quite responsible work. And we, these children, were, these um, lads and lasses, there were a few lasses, um, were supervised in their placements, both internally by the company and also a member of the academic staff at college would visit them several times during the year. And I used to visit <coughs> students in the um, forensic science laboratories in Lambeth, you know, uh, where they did forensic science work for Met, Met Police. Uh, there's another one in South Wales I used to visit. Um, a lot of the drugs companies, um, May and Baker in those days, used to take students from us. Rome Polonk, I think it might have been by then. Anyway, you know what I mean, down at uh, <coughs> and. Um, it was extremely successful. But then it became more and more difficult <coughs> as um, industry declined to place these students in, in sensible um, companies. And so that, that all fell apart. And the degree still exists, but it doesn't have the, the industrial year. So really, it's lost its advantage over other degrees. During my time there, they also um, set up the first uh, physiotherapy degree in mainland uh, Britain there was one running in Ulster before ours. <coughs> this was in conjunction with the School of Physiotherapy at the London Hospital, and that course is still running at the university now. Um, well, I haven't said about the university being created. Have I? <laughs> the next step was in 1991, was it? Yeah, one or two. Yeah, yeah 1991. Um, all the polytechnics were upgraded to university status. So, uh, NELP, um, actually after being NELP, it became PEL, because there was a, a North London Polytechnic, I don't know if you people remember that, and there was an awful lot of student unrest there during those years, and NELP was often confused with uh, North London Poly, so it was decided to change the name to PEL, Polytechnic of East London, to avoid any confusion. Anyway, we became the University of East London, and it's still on today, and sort of you know, close to the Olympics and so on. Um, in 1993, I was seriously ill. I was off sick for six months. And um, at that time, um, people over the age of 50, I was 53 then, were being given the option to retire early with 10 years enhancement of their pension. And it was a golden gate for me, you know. So I grabbed it with both hands and I then worked part time for five years. So I retired fully in 1998. And along the way, I was promoted from lecturer to, um, well, it's something I haven't mentioned actually. We, we got our first mortgage on the strength of my income and a part of my wife's income. And what we didn't tell the Cooperative Permanent Building Society was of course my wife was pregnant, so <laughs> um, she banked on me getting promotion. You don't quickly. tell all these things to me. No, no, no. <laughs> anyway, fortunately I, I was promoted within about a year, so it wasn't a, a financial problem for us or for the Cooperative Permanent Building Society. But then, um, Later, about 10 years later, I, I became a senior lecturer and that's, that was how I ended up a senior lecturer in the, in the biology department. Um, just 
trying to think. I've written, written down a load of cards here, but I'm not <laughs> still referring to them. Maybe that would have been better than I had done. Ah, yes. Um, I joined Round Table in about 1967. And um, this is why you know, I knew quite a bit about your, you know, the Rotarian organisation. Okay. And um, one evening they had a, uh, an international dinner. And these two young Austrians came in. They were um, uh, German assistants at a school in Howard Wood. And um, they were very pleasant. And uh, we invited them over to our house for a, a meal. And the friendship grew. And they spent the Christmas with us that year. And then um, Farina's parents came over and had a holiday over here. And they visited us. And you know, we, we maintained contact. And we're still in contact with them now. We, um, we've spent holidays with them in Salzburg, they live in Salzburg, which many of you know is a very attractive town, uh, sound of music country, um, and they've, they've spent time with us here. So, um, as Ellie was saying, you know, I'm keen to be involved in the international side of things. Uh, I firmly feel that you know, the more we can meet people from other countries, um, the better the world will be, because this is how we're going to solve our problems, rather than confronting people the whole time, which seems to have been happening a little bit recently, doesn't it? Yeah. Oh, there we are. As for other interests, um, I also belong to a Probus club, which is a bit like this without the work, you know. <laughs> um, um, I'm the welfare officer of our club, which is the busiest job in the, on the committee. <laughs> <laughs> the first week I had two deaths. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> it's all good fun. You know, you know what the letters P-R-O-B-U-S stand for, do you? Prostate removed, other bits under surveillance. <laughs> We're fortunate to have our children living in Upminster, they're both married. Our daughter Helen has uh, two boys, um, age 13 and 11, they're both pupils at um, Cooper's. Our son, um, he and his wife Alison have a little boy who's three years old. Um, so we are so fortunate. I mean, when you hear people who have uh, one family in Australia, another in South Africa, and a third in North America, you know, it's, it's so so convenient and nice to see them growing up and you know forming links with them as they, as they go on their way. Um, so that takes up a bit of time. Um, hobbies, apart from that, um, I've always been keen on nature conservation. So. Um, I'm a member of the Essex Wildlife Trust and I take part in work parties on our local nature reserve, Cranham Marsh. I guess many of you know the existence of that place. Mm. Do you? I hope you, hope you do. Yeah. <laughs> Those who live in that yeah. So we have work parties twice a month in the winter, uh, second Thursday and the uh, last Sunday of the month. So if any of you feel really energetic, you're burning to use some energy and get fit, you'd be very welcome to join us. <laughs> you, you wouldn't feel out of place, they're most, mostly people of your mature years, so, you know, <laughs> We're looking for young, young members, actually, but... <laughs> Um, <laughs> um, other than that, we enjoy foreign travel, and um, I, I'm very keen on jazz. You know, jazz appreciation is another of my hobbies. I'm keen on gardening, having an allotment. Um, my wife and I play bridge, um, and I play another time a week with a male friend. And um, I'm also interested in uh, ornithology. So you know. Lead a pretty full life, <laughs> and um, in my spare time I come here. Um, no, um, seriously, I've only been here four or five months now. I really enjoyed getting involved in the work of the Rotarian organisation, and I look forward to spending more time uh, helping on your various projects. And uh, with that, I think I end. Um,
Thank you. 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 Um, well, the only reason I'm a West Ham supporter was that when my son was a little lad and wanted to support West Ham and was too young to go to Upton Park on his own, I was dragged along with him. I've all my life been really a totally non-sporting person, although I did earn my first sports trophy at 65 playing croquet. <laughs> At the Unminster Croquet Club, which has now ceased to exist, because we had two lawns uh, at the rear of Unminster Court. So those were lost <coughs> when the place was redeveloped. Why were they lost? Um, well, initially, <coughs> the new owner said, well, maybe, you know, and then <coughs> they started works. Health and safety, sir. We can't have people wandering around, you know, when we've got builders and, and stuff. And then last year, our chairman contacted them and they said, no, you know, sorry. We know we said maybe, but the answer is no. So. Yeah. And the nearest croquet club now is at uh, Riddle, which is <laughs> a little bit too far. I felt personally the council, uh, they had some obligation to find an alternative place for us, but they, they didn't view it like that. <laughs> Hard luck, kind of, kind of thing, but there we are. What is it? Yes, thank you. Well, thank you, Bob. That uh, an extremely interesting. I've known Bob since he moved into Avon Road. In fact, I have a, a, a photograph of his daughter and my son in bed together <laughs> when they were uh, just born, they were 10 days apart and um, that we've grown up ever since, um, been, been good friends over the years and our kids have grown up and uh, although they don't keep in touch in terms of meeting, we do meet up every now and again and, uh, and, we, and renew our friendship. So. Uh, I did know lots of this about Bob, but I didn't know all of it. So thank you, Bob, for reminding me. Um, and as such, it's always interesting to hear members' life stories and, and what happens and what makes them tick. And Bob, your story is very interesting indeed. So let's show our appreciation. To I think it's excellent. We've already had the several members uh, give their life stories and they've been really interesting. So um, if you would like to volunteer to run, if not run, I suggest you just colour people and, uh, and volunteer and go, go up and, and get them to put their name on the dotted line like you normally do. So, bye.